Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Dear viewer, God bless you so much. Thank you for tuning in to our moment this Thursday. Thank you for being with us on this program. I am so delighted to be part of you. And my name is Pastor Kenny Afra. I'm talking to you all the way from the River of Life Fellowship, Don Home Nairobi. And uh, we are talking about what I call the reason for the season. And so just allow us to pray so that we can come to the subject right this moment. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you because of the grace and the favor that you've given to us. But this far, oh God, you have brought us. You've given to us the word. You've given to us the truth concerning the season that we live in. And dear Father, I pray that everybody listening will truly receive that which is coming from the heart of the Lord. And dear Father, you will minister to everybody by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in a great way in jesus mighty name i worship and bless you amen i want to come to you dear viewer and thank thankful to the lord because of this opportunity i want to come to you and continue on the subject that we've been talking about that we call the reason for the season we've understood a couple of things and a couple of times that the reason why god has permitted a season like this is so that god may birth the glorious church we have seen over and over again that what exists at the church of christ that is presented to the global eye of mankind is what is is called the Babylon church and that God is intent on making sure that he gets to birth the glorious church out of this mix so that humanity will truly glorify God it's been we've said over and over again the church in its present form does not glorify God that is the reality it actually causes humanity to be more confused than directed and guided and God has an agenda to birth a church that when you look at a people that when you look at you will never mistake the fact that redemption works that redemption is real you will never doubt the fact that redemption has power to change a human life. And one of the signature things or factors that will identify or define the glorious church, as we have said over and over again, is that the church will carry the glory of God. We have seen that long enough. I don't want to go back there. And so we've been talking about how to set yourself apart to be part or as part of the glorious church. You want to be part of it because when you look in the scripture then you understand that when Jesus comes to rapture the church that there are those many that were left the Bible said that two will be lying in the same bed one will be taken the other is left and two will be grinding on a hand meal or one will be taken the other will be left and two will be together in the field and one will be taken and the other will be left and two can be together in the same church service because it's possible that when Jesus comes to rapture the church it might be to some people a church service and some will be taken in the church service and others will be left and so the question you want to ask yourself is how can I make sure that I'm part of that glorious church and that's why we're talking about you setting yourself apart as part of the glorious church and coming to the place where you ensure that you make sure that you are part of that glorious church that you are not going to live in doubt hallelujah you are going to make sure that you set yourself apart to be the glorious church that is what Peter said spoke about the book of second peter he said that he must come to the place where you have the assurance of salvation everybody must get involved in the process to come to the place where you know that you know you are not living in doubt you cannot forsake so much of the world and be in church and then when the time comes for rapture then you are left you must come to the place where you have the assurance of of faith and assurance of salvation that when the time comes for the church to be raptured you are going to be raptured and before that takes place there must be the birthing of the glorious church and i'm going to tell you that this season spells it out god's intent is to birth the glorious church and that is why you want to begin to consecrate yourself as part of the glorious church and that's that's the thing that we're talking about right now and so today i want to tell you i want to show you that if you're truly going to be part of the glorious church you must build God a throne 
you must come to the place where in your life God has a throne. God must have a throne in your life. God must be enthroned in your life. God must become king settings when you find the throne you will always know that it's the the most important position the most important setting the most important platform that is set amongst mankind and it is always said for the person that is set apart by that setting as the most important person but when that point is sinking to your spirit, you set up a throne on the platform of any human setting. You set up a, a throne as the most important platform. And it is set apart for the person that in that setting has been set apart or recognized as the most important person. The throne in any setting of human life is the highest position. So when it is created, it is created in the highest position. And it is always set up for the person that the people in that setting have decided to set up as the highest person. Set up on the highest position. That is what a throne is. Number three, a throne is the platform of ultimate authority in any setting. It is the platform of ultimate authority. And again, it is set Set up or designed for the person that is given the right to exercise ultimate authority over that setting. I am coming down and I'm seeking that you get to understand the principles and lay the foundation about the throne in this place. The throne is the platform of dominion. It's always a platform of controls, a platform of reigns, a platform from which someone rules. And it is always designed for the person that that entity or setting of human life has set apart as the one that has been given rule over that setting. It's been given dominion over everything in that setting. It's been given uh, rulership or reign, the platform to reign or the right to reign over for that entire entity that is what a throne is meant for a throne is the center of power the power of every human setting is actually accumulated and placed on the throne and whoever is placed on the throne therefore is given that ultimate power to exercise and the last point that is important is the throne is the platform of glory all of the glory that is that is present, that is attainable in that human setting is accumulated and placed on the throne. And when somebody is sitting on the throne, when somebody is given the right to sit on the throne, he is given the, the accumulated glory of that setting. That is what a throne is. And so the throne is actually designed for a king. That is important. Let me give you a simple example with what you are familiar with that will make sense easily. Let's come to a country and let's look in our present time that we're dealing with democratic setting. Let's look at a man that is called a president. Now, if you go to every nation, you will discover that a president is purely an ordinary human being. He was born human being. It's not angelic he was born human being there was a time he was in the womb there was a time he was born he has two eyes like everybody has two hands like everybody he has the same brain like everybody he has feet like everybody he is somebody that is an ordinary citizen of a nation when he is given the throne he is set up on the most important platform because the nation has seen reason to accord him the stature of the most important person in that country that it was a president is and so when he's given the throne is set up on the most important position the most important platform as the person that the nation has decided to accord the stature and the identity of the most important person that is really what a president is a president has been given a throne because the throne is the highest position and this human being has
has for some reason been decided upon by the nation to be accorded the most high position or the highest position because it's been elevated by everybody in that nation as the highest. A throne is a platform of authority and when it is designed it is so that whoever sits upon it is accorded the ultimate authority over that nation. So when you get to, get to set up a president and set him up on the throne, you give him the ultimate authority over the nation. So now he has the right to exercise power over the nation. He has the right to carry the ultimate authority over that nation. I'm going down to something. And I pray that you can be following this because this is going to be so important for everybody that's listening to me. The throne is the platform of dominion. So when somebody is placed on the throne as president, he has been given the ultimate dominion over the entire nation, over all the people, over everything in the nation. He has dominion over the, the economy of the nation, over the health system, over the powers that be, over the military, over the, the, the intelligence system. He has dominion over everybody in that nation. He has been accorded the right to exercise reign, to exercise power, to exercise dominion over the entire nation. He's somebody that is ordinary, but when he's placed on the throne, it's because humanity in that nation have decided to set him up on the platform to exercise dominion over everything in the entire nation. I want you to understand that dominion is rulership. It is rain. It basically has to do with control. It has to do with governance. So when somebody is placed on the throne to become the president, he has been accorded the right to govern the nation and its peoples to a place of their destiny. The throne is the platform of power. And when somebody is placed on the national throne, he is accorded the ultimate power over the entire nation. That is how powerful it is. The throne is a platform of glory. All of the glory of the nation is accumulated and placed on the throne. And so when you elect a president and you place him on the throne, you give him you accord him, you bestow upon him the entire glory of the entire nation so that he carries the glory of the nation. I pray that you can see that right now as we talk this deep stuff in here. Now the reality is that this is true of God. That wherever God is, God needs a throne. God must be given a throne, whether you're dealing with your personal life, or you're dealing with the family, or you're dealing with a community of peoples, or you're dealing with a nation, God has to be given a throne. Now God will be to you what you give him a platform to be in your life. Let me give you an example. When you give God a platform to be your savior, when you give him your soul to save you, God becomes your savior. When you give God your life to heal, God will be your healer. He's a faithful healer. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. And you can relate to God as your healer. And God can heal you. And you can experience the divine health of God. And you can experience the healing hand and power of the living God in your life. But it is possible that God is your savior, but God is not your provider. That is the sad reality because God is going to be in your life what you actually give him a platform to be. So God can be your savior. So your soul is saved and your soul is whole and your soul is going to heaven. You have a license to go to heaven when you die. You have a license to eventually go to heaven when you die. But the same God that is your savior is not your personal provider. Well, you, for God to be your provider there is a platform you got to give him as your provider. That's why you find that God speaks to us and he says bring the whole tithe 
into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. He said, try me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour so much blessing upon your life. God says, one man gives freely and gains even more. That's Proverbs 11, but number 24. And he says, another withholds more than is right and comes to poverty. God is talking about a people that are his people. And he's saying among his people, one man gives freely and gains even more because he says give and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. When the people of Macedonia, the church in Macedonia, partnered with Saul's ministry, with with Apostle Paul's ministry. Paul spoke to them in Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 19. And he said, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He did not speak but to everybody. He spoke but to people that were relating to God in a certain way. And they created a platform for God to become their provider. Because it is possible that God is your Savior who has given you an ultimate license to go to heaven when you die but he is not your personal provider for God to be your provider there is a platform you got to raise for him for God to become your provider that is how you must relate to him I'm praying that you're getting what I'm saying that's how you got to relate to God financially God wants you to be faithful in handling finances God wants you to be faithful God watches to see how you handle finances remember Abel and Cain in the book of Genesis chapter number four the Bible said that the two sons of 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 this man called Adam saw the need to give to God there was no preacher there was no pastor there was no Bible to read from and somewhere they actually realized that this is human responsibility that when you're relating to God you must become a giver because giving is the ultimate manifestation and proof of loving that's why the Bible says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because loving gives and giving is loving and so as boys that are beginning to relate to God they decided to give God and the Bible says that Abel owned the flock and he gave the choice best most fattened rum to God Almighty and the scripture says that Cain planted the soil and he gave some of the grains and God looked with favor at the giving of Abel but he did not look with favor at what Cain gave. Why? Because giving was important to God. And when they gave that way, they were creating a platform for God to relate to them. Why? Because, because for God to become your provider, you must get to create a platform for him to become your provider. Now, let me give you a simple example in the Bible that will help you understand what I'm saying. If you look in the book of Luke chapter number 16, Jesus speaks to us, verse number 19 to 21. I've talked about this scripture over and over again. Jesus speaks to us about a man that is called Lazarus, who was a saved brother. He gave his soul to God as his savior. And God was his savior. And he was saved, he was going to heaven. And the scripture says that Jesus spoke about it, saying, in a certain town, there was a certain rich man who was always clothed in purple and fine lining and lived in luxury every day. But the next word is not nice. He said, at his gate, there was laid a poor beggar that was called Lazarus that was covered up with the sauce all over his skin. He longed from what fell from the rich man's table and even the dogs came and licked his sores. But the man was a poor beggar. But when you look at the subsequent verses, then Jesus says what happened when the two of them died. That Lazarus died and he was gathered by the angels to Abraham's bosom. In other words, Lazarus was a saved brother who went to heaven. And the, the rich man eventually died and he went to hell. He went to hell not because he was rich. He went to hell because he didn't have relationship with the Lord. He had never given his life to God to save him. Lazarus had. So 
why Lazarus was saved, he was a poor beggar. Because when he gave God his soul to be his savior, he never gave God a platform to be his provider. Because it's possible for you to give God your soul to save you, but you've never given God your life to be your provider. In the same way you can actually give God your soul to save you, but you've never entrusted God to heal you. In fact, I've got to tell you that there are people that theologically actually disagree and contend against miraculous healing in our time. And so it's possible that you're theolo theologically informed and your soul is saved, but you contend against God's divine healing power. And as long as you fight God's divine healing power, you have never given God your life to heal even though you gave him your soul to save that is the sad reality beloved that you can give God your soul to save but you have never given him a platform to be your provider you have never given him a platform to be your healer but that's not my point it is possible that while God is your savior he is not your king that is the sad reality that it is possible that you are somebody that's given God your soul to save and through the blood of Jesus Christ and through your faith in Christ Jesus God has given you license to go to heaven your soul is saved from sin and God has made you the righteousness of God and God has given you license to go to heaven but God is not your king God is not your king he has saved you but it's not your king. Let me give you a simple example with Israel. In the book of Judges, chapter number 17, verse number 6, you find a story there, the prelude to that verse is a story about a man that was called Micah, who stole his mother's 1,100 shekels of silver. And the scripture said that the mother added a curse in his hearing and he decided to bring back the silver to his mother. And the mother decided to dedicate 200 of those 1100 shekels of silver to Micah her son to turn into, into to dedicate to the Lord and to build brazen altar or brazen altar and image of an idol. In other words, she gave this money to her son to build an idol. There were people that were so backslidden. The people of Israel were so backslidden at that time that getting to build idols was the norm and the order of the day. And the Bible concludes in verse number 9, verse number 7, verse number 6, that in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Israel had no king now. I'm going to walk with you through this because you're going to see that God had actually come to Israel and sought to be their king. But at that time, they, at that time, they had lost God's kingship somewhere. They had detached themselves as the people that were under the kingship of God. So Israel had no king. And because they had no king, everyone did as he saw fit. And I'm going to tell you, beloved, that it's truly possible with somebody's life. It is possible that in your life God is a savior, but God has never been given a platform to become king. And so because of that, anything does in your life as it sees fit. There's so many saints in the kingdom of God that truly love the Lord, that they've given their souls to the Lord, but because God has never been given a throne to become king, everything does in your life as it sees fit. Whatever anything wants to do, whenever it wants to do it, it just does it. You'd be shocked to discover how many saints live at the mercy of death that can be killed by the force of death any time that death wants to. Why? Because God is not king and so anything does in your life whatever it wants to do. That is the principle that I wanted to get, beloved. And so in order for God to become your king, you must give him a platform. And the platform from which anyone becomes king 
his throne. So every time that a people give God a throne, you give God a throne because God is the most important person in your life. So you give him the most important position because the throne is the most important position. So you give God the most important position because you want him to be your king. I pray you get that. Hallelujah. You give God the throne because the throne is the highest position. The highest position. You give it to God because you want God to sit on the highest position in your life. Why? Because it's supposed to be the most high. You give God a throne that is supposed to be the platform of ultimate authority because you want God to exercise ultimate authority over your life. That is why you give God a throne. You give him a throne because you want God to have the, the right to exercise his authority over your life. The word authority is also the, the word out of which we get the word author. You want God to author things in your life. You want God to transform you. You want God to change you. You want God to create things that don't exist in your life. You want God to change you and transform you and make you a completely different person. The same way that when he came in the life of a man that is called Abraham, he decided to take a man that was 75 years old, barren, without a child. And he told him, I will make you the father of many nations. He's coming to author something that Abraham never had the power to dream about, being the father of nations. But the time that God is talking to him, he has not one child hallelujah but God tells him you are going to be the father of many nations God authors something in his life that no country could have authored no parent could have authored only God can author God told him I will bless you and make you a blessing God told him whoever blesses you I will bless and whoever curses you I will curse God told him I'm going to bless you and make your name great I'm going to make your name great nothing no entity had the power to make Abram's name great only God had that ability and so God came to author what could never be authored in his life because he gave God the platform to exercise God's authority over his life but authority also has to do with the right to exercise power. And so when you give God that platform, you're giving him the right to exercise power. That is the principle. Authority is the right to exercise power. So when God called the Israelites, he called them to give him a platform to exercise his power. Every time that you give God a throne, you give him a platform to exercise dominion. When you give God a throne over your life, you want the dominion of God to be established. You want the kingdom of God to be established over your life. You want the kingdom of God to be established over your family, over your household, over your ministry, over your nation, over your community. Every time that you give God a throne, you give him a platform from which to exercise dominion. You want God to be your governor. You want God to be your guide. You want God to be your controller. You want God to reign over your life. You'll be shocked to discover how many people are in church and they've given God their soul to save, but God is not in control. God is not in control of your life. God cannot govern you. You govern yourself. You are governed by emotions. You are governed by feelings. Whatever feeling that goes governs you. When you feel angry towards people, you can do whatever you want. You can throw your hands at them. You can get to slap them in the face. You can refuse to talk to them. As long as you're feeling, feelings control you. Feelings become more important than God and than everybody in your life. It is possible that feelings control you but God does not so relationships that are important are breaking in your life because your feelings have become your God and they control you God controls you when you give him a throne a platform of dominion so that God may have dominion over your life that God may be your governor your guide and your controller that is what it means when you give God a throne consciously you give him a platform to be the one in dominion over your life. You give God a throne over your life. You give him a platform to exercise his power. Hallelujah. 
It is possible, beloved, that God is in your life. But in your life, God is weak. I want you to get that putting in perspective. Everywhere that God has sovereignty and that God has a throne, God's power reigns. But it's possible for God to be in somebody's life and evil power reigns. It is possible that satanic force reigns. God can be in your life and depression reigns. God can be in your life and satanic force and voices reign in your life. Why? Because you've never given him a throne so that he can exercise his power. So it's possible that God is strong in one nation and God is weak in another nation. It is possible that God is strong in somebody's life and God is weak in another person's life. I can show you scripture. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter number, chapter number 12, the Bible said that Paul, a learned lawyer who is a strong Jew, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, hallelujah, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, one of the most highly educated lawyers, so strict as a Pharisee, it says as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Paul was such a strong guy. God took a strong man that carried so much strength and God got to the place where God is giving him revelation and God knows that if God does not tamper with Paul's strength that somewhere Paul is going to misunderstand God's strength for his strength and he will rob God of glory. So God spoke to him. God sent a thorn in his flesh and Paul gives that, that, that conversation but number 7 to 10 it says to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations there was given to me a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me think about Paul the apostle being tormented by a messenger of Satan. Why? Because there is so much revelation God's given to him and God knows that if it's not tampered with, he's going to be conceited. He's going to be full of pride and full of himself and God will be robbed of glory and the mission of God in his life is going to be jeopardized because of lack of glory for God. And so God sends the thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment him. And Paul gives a report and he says this word. He said, three times I asked the Lord to take it away. But God spoke to me saying, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, my power is made perfect in you only through your weakness. In other words, God will say, as long as you are strong, my power is weak. As long as you're strong, my power cannot be made perfect. And it's possible that in somebody's life, God's power cannot be made perfect because some things have kept God's power from functioning. That is what we're talking about. And so it is possible that you give God a platform so that his power manifests. But it's possible that you rob God of a platform for his power to manifest. And that's why when you look in the scripture, Jesus has given the disciples the great commission that is given to all the church. He said, go ye into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. But then he goes on to say, us, but do not leave the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. He's telling them, even though you've been my disciples over the years, even though I've given you the great commission, you don't have God's power. In other words, God's power is not made perfect in your life. God's power is not yet established in you. You don't have God's power. God is not strong in your life. God does not have power in your life. He's saying, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be witnesses unto me. He was saying, carry in the city and give God a platform to bestow his power upon your life so that in your life, God is powerful because it's possible for you to be saved and while you're saved, God is not powerful in your life. You know what I'm talking about, beloved, don't you? Hallelujah. That is the principle. 
So it's possible to be saved, but because you've not given God the platform to display and manifest his power, that God can be weak in your life. So anything does as it desires in your life, and it succeeds. God says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. But there is a weapon in your life that prospers as you watch. There is a force of evil prospering. There's a rock of evil prospering. And the reason is simple. In your life, the enemy is strong, but God is weak, even though your soul is sick. That is the principle. And so, when you give God a throne, you give him a platform from which to exercise his power. That is the principle. The throne is the platform, is the platform of glory. However, you give the throne in your life, you give them the platform to bestow their glory upon you. When you give God the throne in your life, you give him a platform to bestow glory. I pray that I can be able to talk a little more deeply. Let me give you a simple example of Israel before we look at the throne in your life. And then I'm going to get out of your way. If you look at Israel, the Bible said that God spoke to Israel. If you look at some scriptures, like the one that we just talked about, the book of Judges, chapter number 17, verse number 6, then you begin to get certain signals. The Bible said that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone does as he pleases. If you look at 1 Samuel, chapter number 8, verse number 7, there came a time when the Israelites cried out to Samuel to give them a king because up to that moment, God had been their king. God had been their king and I will show you how God became their king. God had been their king and now because Samuel
an altar of God Almighty. And if you're truly fed on this altar, then you can tell if it's God's altar or is an altar for man to make wealth. And so I know that you know when you're being compelled and manipulated to give and you know when you're being given a chance to exercise what you really desire to give because giving must come from the heart because God loves a cheerful giver. So on this altar, there's no compulsion. We don't manipulate you, but we just give you a chance. I'm not seeing you right now, but you're seeing me and it is possible that in your heart, you desire to give of your tithe. You desire to give of your offering. And you feel this is the, the altar you want to sow all of that into. You want to be partner with our ministry. You want to be partner. We need partners as a ministry. There are projects that we want to carry out that are very great. And I long for partnership that we actually have a people that are standing out and saying I'm partner with the Kenya for ministries. So that we can be able to install and get to roll out everything that God's put in our lives on this altar to benefit humanity. And so if you want to do that, just talk to us, indicate, get to um, SMS, get to call us, and get to take our numbers and send your givings right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for everybody that wants to give of their substances and release your blessing upon the lives of your people. According to your word, you have said, our Father, that he will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour so much blessing that there will not be room enough for it. And today, Father, I release that blessing upon the lives of your people people and I pray let your favor come upon everybody in Jesus mighty name amen I don't want to close this without getting to invite you dear viewer to give your life to Christ there is somebody that's never given your life to Christ and you're watching and I'm sure you want to do that just say this prayer after me as long as you mean it from the heart the Lord is going to see what you're saying and God is going to receive you just say Lord Jesus I come to you. I acknowledge that I'm a human life that needs the saving grace of God upon my life. I give you my life today to be my savior. Come into my life and save my soul in Jesus name. Simple prayer it is though very powerful when meant from the heart. And that's how salvation is executed. You've just given your life to Christ. So what you're going to do is call us. Let us know that you've given your life to Christ. And if you're able to visit us on Sunday, we are here for you. If you're not able to come physically to our church because of lack of proximity, then you can be able to reach out to a church that you know preaches Christ. Not every church does. And you can be able to give them your life and tell them you've given your life to Christ and you desire to be discipled and to rise up and grow and become a strong, established kingdom citizen. May God bless you very much. I want to invite you to our Q&A on Saturday, 12.30. Every Saturday we have what they call Ask Pastor Ya first. That moment when we are coming to pour our hearts out, some of those secret questions that we've been in church for so long. And somebody may even have preached on that subject, but there's something that just never clicked. And you still feel there's something that is a question. It actually hinders your faith. Because as long as there's any gray area, you will struggle to truly have holistic faith. And so you are asking for clarity. You just want some clarity. You're not presenting an argument like the Pharisees did with Jesus. You're just presenting something that you really genuinely long clarity on, long for clarity on. And in case the Lord gives us that clarity, then of course we'll give it to you. Send such questions between now and Saturday morning so that when we come together, then of course we can be able to deal with your question. Do not hold them. Don't send too late. Send while the line is still on. God bless you so much. And I invite you for our Freedom Mission Schools on Saturday, 8 o'clock to 9 p.m. Powerful. You want to be part of it. God bless you so much. Amen. God bless you so much. And I invite you for our Freedom Mission Schools on Saturday, 8 o'clock to 9 p.m.